Amen. I want to say good night again as we begin passing out our first two study guides. We're going into a very interesting three-day session of Bible teaching as well as practical application of the gospel of health. For those who may not be familiar with the concept of the gospel of health, we're going to be looking at uh, on these nights, tonight, tomorrow, and Wednesday night, we're looking at this idea of what is the gospel of health. Why in Matthew 10 did Jesus both preach and heal? And why do we see so little healing among God's people? Especially, you'll find in the Christian churches, you'll find many churches that talk about healing. But in the Christian churches that talk about healing and even focus on healing, you have the highest rates of diabetes, arthritis, and various other diseases. God says that there is going to be a people upon the earth that he wishes would, not pro would prosper and be in health. And we want to be among that people. Amen? Tonight, as we look at the Word of God, we want to pass on those two handouts. One is called... Practical Principles of Gospel Healing Part 1, and then Practical Principles of Gospel Healing Part 2. Again, you have two handouts to begin with. One is Practical Principles of Gospel Healing Part 1, and Practical Principles of Gospel Healing Part 2. In these two handouts, you're going to have outlined the scriptures we'll be looking at tonight. So every scripture that we're going to be looking at generally is going to be on here. I may throw some inside there, but yet the scriptures we're going to be mainly dealing with in this systematic study in the gospel of health, as well as practical application, are going to be on your study guides. So we're starting out with the practical principles of gospel healing. And if everyone has a hand, I'll say amen. 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 Does not anyone not have a hand out at this time? Raise your hand. Okay. We'd like to take our Bibles and take practical principles of gospel healing part one and turn to our first text, number one, which is Jeremiah 33, 6. We're taking practical principles of gospel healing part one and we're turning to the book of Jeremiah 33 and verse 6. How many are looking in the book of Jeremiah right now? Anyone? Amen. All right, I hear one amen. Okay, very good. We're looking for the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 33 and verse 6. I want you to notice this promise of God, which is going to be the theme of much of our study tonight and all through the next nights. Jeremiah 33 and verse 6. Say amen when you have that. Amen. In verse 6 it says, Behold, I will bring it, health and cure, and I will cure them, and reveal unto them the abundance of what? Peace and truth. Here in this promise, Jesus says, God, the God of the Bible says, that he will bring it both health and what? And cure. In other words, God will bring health, and also, if we are in need of healing, he'll bring what? Healing. He'll bring what? It says what? Cure. So many people are looking for cures to the various ailments they have, but who promises cure? God promises cure. Even when we talk about modern medicine, modern medicine has its role, but yet still the true healer is who? It's God. God said he will bring health, he will bring cure. And notice what he says going on. Read it again. Behold, I will bring it, health and cure, and I will cure them and do what? Reveal unto them. Reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. In other words, when God is designed to bring healing and cure, what does he connect with the healing cure that he brings? Peace and truth. How many are trying to find healing without truth? Brothers and sisters, where do we find truth? Truth is in the word of God. So if we want to understand how to find healing, to find health and cure, where should we look? In the word of God. Because God says the way that he brings healing, he brings health, he brings cure, is in connection with the word. And every true principle of healing will be found in the Word. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. There are people that have sometimes um, a gallbladder that is very, very inflamed, and they are on the verge of possibly dying unless something is done. Do those people sometimes get surgery? Is surgery in the Bible? How did women get here? What did God do to Adam? Put him in a deep sleep. And the Bible says he opened up the side. So life came out of a surgery. The first surgery brought women into existence. Amen? Amen? And God means that the principles that are going to be used to the best benefit to man are found in the Word of God. We can find a biblical basis for everything that we do. And the true Christian lives by the Word, word of God. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If we truly want to live as Jesus lived, Jesus said, man, even the son of man, shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If there's something that I'm going to do or practice, it must be found where? 
in the Word of God. So here in Jeremiah 33 and verse 6, the Bible says clearly that if we want to look for health and cure, we look to God. And the method by which God pr produces that health and cure for us is in connection with Him revealing truth. That's why tonight we're going to look at some practical things that we can do even tonight to start changing our health to bring about the biblical type of cure and healing that God has. And we're going to find these principles in His Word. That's why we're starting out even looking at these principles in the Scriptures, in the Word of God. Look at number two now. Number two. We're studying it together. In number two it says, Lease with what? Medicinal, what are we studying? We're studying the gospel of health, right? And in the gospel of health, in the principles by which God brings healing, has God taught in his revealing truth that we may have cure that there's medicinal properties in leaves, the leaves of trees, the leaves of plants? Oh, yeah. Let's look at the text, Ezekiel 47. No one wanted to say anything there. Let's, let's look at Ezekiel. Let's look at the word. Ezekiel 47. Because I want to let you know that there are healing properties in plants. As a matter of fact, where do most medicines you buy in the store, where do most medicines come from? Yes. Come from plants. But you don't have to necessarily go to a pharmacy to acquire these healing properties. As a matter of fact, when you eat spinach, what is spinach? It's a leaf, isn't it? Is it not? Yes. Is it good for you? Yes. Does it bring strength to the body? And these things are provided by God for the healing of the nations, even you and I. Look what it says in Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel 47 and verse 12. We're going to look at these Bible texts. Look at the Bible foundation before we get to something very, very practical in a moment. Ezekiel 47 and verse 12 is where we're going. Say amen when you have that. Amen. Notice what God says about the divine plan that he even has in heaven. In Ezekiel 47, 12, it says, And by the river, upon the banks thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for what? For meat, for food, right? Whose leaves shall not fade, now shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their wars they issued out of the sanctuary. And the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for... Now where is this tree found? It's found in heaven, right? It's the tree of life. And this tree of life, the fruit is for food, and the leaf is for what? Mess. And Revelation 22, Revelation 22 tells us that these leaves of the tree in heaven are for the healing of the nation. nation. There's some type of healing that we need even when we reach the heavenly shore that God's going to give to us through the leaves of a tree. Now you may say, well preacher, that's in heaven. That has nothing to do with us now because that's, that's all the way in heaven. We don't have to do that down here. But what does the Lord's Prayer say? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Are you a Bible Christian? Do you believe in the Word of God? God's plan that's going to be fulfilled and consummated and brought to completion in heaven must be started here. down here. We don't start loving Jesus up there. We start loving Jesus down here. We don't start serving Jesus up there. We start serving Jesus down here. We don't start following Jesus up there. We start following Jesus down here. Order my steps where? In your word. In your word. In your word. Look at number three. We're studying tonight. We're studying. Number three. Hezekiah's fig poultice. What we're doing is finding examples all throughout the word of God that God has a method of healing, a healing principle, principles of healing that we find all throughout the scripture. And we're drawing them together because we want to be healed. We want cure. And God is through the abundance and revealing of truth tonight going to show you those methods of cure and healing. Look at here's Zechariah's fig poultice. Second Kings 20. We're going to the Old Testament again. Second Kings 20, beginning with verse 5. Second Kings chapter 20 and verse 5. When you find that, please say amen. 2 Kings 20 and verse 5. Notice what the Word of God says tonight. 2 Kings 20 and verse 5. You know King Hezekiah, right? Amen. And you know King Hezekiah had a terrible, terrible ailment, and there was seemingly no hope for him. And notice what it says here in 2 Kings 20 and verse 5. It says, turn again. This is God speaking to, Hezekiah, to the prophet Isaiah. Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have what? I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. Stop right there. God said he'll do what? Heal. He said, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. I will do what? I will heal you. And God's word is enough. Amen? Amen. God says it. I believe it. It's settled. But brothers and sisters, God said this and also God said something also, because when we look at what God said, God said, I will heal you, but I want you to know that the faith in this word had to have 
a corresponding work. Let me put it this way. When Jesus was upon the earth, did he tell a man that his faith could make him whole? Amen. And then told him to get up and walk? Why couldn't he just be healed lying down on the ground there? Did Jesus take, fit, take clay and put it on a man's eyes? Was that enough? Why tell him to go and wash too? You see how you see faith and works? Why tell him to go and wash if, if just only the word was enough? The word is enough. But if we have faith in the word, we're going to walk in the word. We're going to obey the word, right? And Jesus never showed the idea of just faith only. He says faith and works works. The perfect man is going to have such faith in God, it's going to empower him to do and obey the will of God. So when we look at the book of 2 Kings, notice that God said, you know what? Go back, Isaiah, and tell Hezekiah, I have heard his prayer, I have saw his tears, and I will heal him, like Jeremiah 33 says. But I'm going to use a method of healing that is going to show that he has faith in me because as he complies with this, the healing will come as he obeys my word. I will heal him, but I want him to be obedient to the truth I show him. Notice what it says. We're in 2 Kings 20 again. 2 Kings 20. Let's read it again. Verse 5 says, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee on the third day. Thou shalt go up into the house of the Lord. Verse 6. And I will add unto thy days 15 years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Look at verse 7. And Isaiah said, take a lump of figs and they took and laid it on the board and he a lump of figs. He recovered not just by the word of God alone which was all sufficient but also Hezekiah was told also to put this lump of fig, what the, what the, the modern language calls a poultice, natural remedy is called, called it a poultice, was placed upon this boil, this growth that was causing him to lose his life. And because he had faith in God's word and complied with seemingly this foolishness. Who could put some fruit on a, on a, on a, on a boil and think it's going to get better? Isn't that foolishness? But what does God do with the foolish things? He takes the foolish things and does what to the wise? He confounds the wise with the foolishness. He takes that which seems to be foolishness and he confounds the wise. And here he said, take this lump of fig. Now, I said, do you know what? This year coming up will be 20 years I've been doing gospel medical missionary work. 20 years. And I've seen countless people healed of various different ailments using these same type of fruits in the same type of way boils and gross and various different things. I've even had someone with very, very terrible arthritic pain in the hands and made a poultice from raisins. All I did was just boil some water and put a handful of raisins inside there and turn the fire off and then cover it. And all that hot water rehydrates those raisins or the grapes, basically what it is. It rehydrates it and you take it out and you mash it and you make what is called a poultice. And when it gets cool enough so it's not going to burn the person, you place it over the hand, and what does it do? It draws out the acids, it draws out the poison, it draws out those things that should not be in the joint or in the hand, and it draws it into itself and draws it out of the flesh. So that the hand now, that had one time had arthritis, is now feeling good, it's moving. I've seen these things work with my own eyes. I've tested the Lord's word and found it to be true. And brothers and sisters, Hezekiah found that not only by the God of heaven said, I will do this, I will heal you, but by also revealing truth to him, even the truth of how he uses healing plants and leaves and medicines from the earth, he was added 15 years to his life. Now, brother, sister, what about you and I? Is God the same yesterday, same. today, and forever? Amen. Can we try God's word? We're going to find, as we study these various scriptures, we're going to find that God is going to show us also a way that we also can look at this idea of what's called natural remedies. We don't have to go to the world to find natural remedies and what health is. The Word of God shows what true health is, even a lifestyle of health, principles of health, and even the most practical teaching of health. We're going on. We're going to number four. Number four. First Timothy chapter five. Fast First Timothy chapter five. We're recording. We're recording. We're recording. So why don't you hold on because we have to take, edit that out. I'm sorry. We'll answer all the questions at the end. But since we're recording, we have to cut that, kind of, that part out if you talk. Excuse me. It says in 2 Timothy 5, this. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 23. We're in the New Testament now. For those that might think that the scriptures we're looking at are only in the Old Testament, 
We're going to step all the way over Jesus' miracles. We're going to come back to it again in a moment. But look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, beginning with verse 23. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Now I know that as we turn to this text in 1 Timothy chapter 5, that some may, may question the, 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 the statement there that says, the therapeutic use of grape juice. Because when we turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5, most people when we look at this text we're about to read, they believe that Paul is telling Timothy to drink a little alcohol so he can get better. This is what people believe. Let's read the text and we'll come back to that. 1 Timothy 5, 1 Timothy 5, and verse 23. Same in when you get that. Amen. It says, Paul speaking to Timothy, he says, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and for thy oft infirmities. Timothy, traveling, doing the various different missionary tours he was doing all over Asia Minor with Paul, had succumbed to stomach problems. And he often had infirmities, and he was so troubled by them, he was often drinking just only water alone. And Paul here recommended he drank a little wine for his stomach's sake and oft infirmities. Now, when we look at the Word of God, many times when people see the word wine, they automatically think, you know, Ernest Gallo, you know, Aste Spumante, all these various different wines that people drink nowadays, all these different alcoholic beverages that people drink. When we look at the Word of God, there are two types of wine in the Bible, two types of, of, of beverages that were drunk in the Old Testament time. There were the pure fruit of the vine that was squeezed into a juice. And there was also the same beverages that were taken and allowed to ferment as we do today and it's made into alcohol. If you look at the book of Proverbs, if you write down notes, look at the book of Proverbs, write down Proverbs 20 and verse 1. In Proverbs 20 and verse 1, the Bible clearly outlines what's the result of taking that wine that is allowed to ferment and to become alcohol and become even a poisonous beverage. The Bible says in Proverbs 20 and verse 1 that wine, this kind of wine, is a mocker. And this kind of dr drink is, this strong drink is raging. And whosoever deceived thereby is not wise. Proverbs goes on to say that don't be deceived when it's turned itself aright in the cup. It's red color. It says that you will get wounds and bruises. And it says you'll see strange women. It says that you will be in a state where you have all this distress come upon you. And then in the morning you say, I'll seek it yet. That means you're addicted now. You're, you're, you're calling back to it over and over again. And you can't get away. This type of wine is not the kind of wine that Jesus asked his followers to drink. As a matter of fact, when we look at the Old Testament, the children of God were told to not drink this type of wine. You remember uh, the sons of Aaron who drank wine and went to the sanctuary and offered strange fire? And God commanded the children of Israel not to drink any type of wine or strong drink? Now, what about today? Do you think Jesus was telling people to drink wine and alcohol? When he, when he made the water into wine, was he making alcohol? Well, let me ask you this question. The Lord's Supper. You ever read that text about the Lord's Supper? What did Jesus say? Jesus said... At the Lord's Supper, he said, take you and drink you all of it, right? If they drank that, all that wine or all alcoholic beverages, then when they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane, then they probably were inebriated. Do you think that was probably the situation? No, because Jesus said clearly, when he said, take you, drink you all of this, he says, I will no longer drink of this, he says, fruit of the vine, until I drink it again new with you, where? In heaven, right? He said, I will no longer drink of this fruit of the vine, he calls it, until I drink it again. The same thing I'm drinking here, I'll drink it again only in heaven. Now, brothers and sisters, in heaven, is anything going to die? Any death up there? No. The old things are passed away, right? Any decay? Any rotting? So how can you have a fermented beverage like alcohol in heaven? He said, the same thing I'm drinking now, I'm not going to drink it again until I drink it in heaven. This was the juice of grapes. There's two types of wine. There's one that the people of God were told to never drink, to never take part of, and there was a kind that God and the people of God 
would drink because these things were good for you. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul says, drink a little of this for thy stomach's sake. Now you say, well, are you sure? Well, brothers and sisters, not only do you have ample scripture to show you there's two types of wine, one that the holy people of God would drink and drink without becoming diseased, destroying their liver, destroying their kidney, destroying their brain cells, even becoming drunk and doing various things they would never do if they were sober. And there was a good type that was also strengthening and giving benefits. Science today is saying that there are amazing healing benefits in the juice of grapes or in many types of juices. There was a study that came out just recently where they were talking about how, how quote unquote wine, even the alcoholic wine, is good for the heart. You ever heard about that? It's good for the heart because it has an antioxidant called quercetin. But guess where quercetin is found also? In grape juice. But it is told that, hey, if you drink wine, and even the places where they drink wine, France and all these places, they have a very low incidence of heart disease. And brothers and sisters, that's true. Guess what they have a high incidence of? Liver disease and kidney disease and various different ailments and incidents connected with alcoholism. Yes, it does have a high amount of quercetin, and quercetin is very good for protecting the heart from heart disease. Very good. But would you rather drink grape juice and preserve your liver, your kidneys, your brain cells, and your reputation from not getting drunk? Or would you take your chances with alcoholic wine? See, somebody that doesn't even have the Bible would choose the first and the latter. But we have ample Bible evidence that when Jesus talked about the wine that he left the disciple to drink, even in the Lord's Supper, it was the same type of pure grape that he would be drinking in the earth made new, where there's no fermentation, no type of decay. Amen. 1 Timothy 5, this was offered to Timothy as a therapeutic benefit. So when we look at this idea, the Bible teaches there's a therapeutic benefit to the juice of fruits. You ever heard of juicing? Yes. Anyone ever heard of juicing? It's very popular right now. Right now. It's a very popular natural remedy. Where is it found? In the Bible. Thousands of years old. The juice of fruits, the juice of vegetables, juice of various plants, had a medicinal use all the way to before the time of Christ. We see it throughout the scriptures. Let's hasten, let's hasten, because we have a, a little bit more to study. Number five. Number five, we look at these practical principles of the gospel of health and gospel healing. Number five, Genesis 3 and verse 18. Genesis, the first book of your Bible, 3 and verse 18. It says, herbs or vegetables added to man's diet due to the effects of sin. Let me turn to Genesis 3. What was the original diet of man? In Genesis 1 and verse 29. We'll turn to Genesis 3 though. It was fruits, nuts and seeds and so on. The Bible says those things that grew from a tree had within it a tree yielding seed. These things were to be for man for his food, for his meat. And this original diet was the first best food of man and it was a, a diet designed by God to supply all the need of the physical body that God made and to maintain him in that state of holiness. However, what happened to this perfect environment and this perfect man that was given this perfect diet? He fell into sin. And because of sin, there was a consequence. Romans says, the wages of sin is death. death. Now, brothers and sisters, you and I, well, I won't put it on you, I have sinned in my life. And even though I have sinned, I have not yet died. But brothers and sisters, between sin or the commission of sin or the habitual act of transgressing God's will, between sin and death, there's a process. And that process is deterioration, decay, disease, and sickness. And this process is a lot of all men to some degree, but God says in the midst of this, this process between sin and death, he says, I wish above all things that thou would do what? Prosper and be in health. That's 3 John 2. Prosper and be in health even as your soul prospereth. The spiritual desire that God has for your health is just as great as his spiritual desire for your soul salvation. Because how does God of heaven want you to really have a spiritual and a great understanding of his word if you're always sick? Is it easy to read the Bible when you're sick? Amen. Is it easy to, 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 to get down there and, and read and understand the Bible when you can't even see your eyes? Or is it easy? You can. It's difficult 
to read, it's difficult to, to understand and to gather from the word of God the things you need when you are racked with pain. Job held on to his faith, but the thing was difficult for him when he was so racked with disease to read and study and to get the brothers and sisters, you can be a witness, but brothers and sisters, the desire that God has for you is not to, to suffer with disease. He says, I desire that you would prosper and be in health, even as your soul. So in this process between sin and death, because death is a lot of every man, he desires that you would have health. He explains the principles of health in the word of God so that these effects of sin can be mitigated. That can be lessened. That even though that we all must die unless Christ comes first, there would be a plan, a way by which the people of God may understand and receive the benefit of God's blessing. What blessings? Not only the word of God generally, but in the word of God, there were counsels and admonition and teachings that would show us how that we could have health or, as the Bible says in John 10, life and life more abundantly. God gave an original diet in Genesis 129, but he had to add something to this now because sin brought disease and disease needs medicine. Do you agree with that? Is there a need of medicine when you have disease? Is there a need of healing? Something that's recuperative or therapeutic? And even though this perfect diet of Genesis 129 was given to maintain health, God gave the green herb or God gave these, these, these herbs of the field in Genesis 3.18 to be a restorative building and recuperative element of diet to combine together to maintain man in that idea of prospering and being in health. Let's look at that. Genesis 3. Genesis 3 and verse 18. Say amen if you have that. Amen. After sin, God goes through all the various different things that are going to happen in the earth to strengthen man as well as to challenge man that he might perfect character in this world of sin. And he says in verse 18 this. Genesis 3, 18. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee and thou may. What does it say there? Thou may if you desire to. It says thou shalt. It's a command. Thou shalt eat thee. Herb of the field. What herbs grow in the field? Cabbage, spinach. All your vegetables grow in the field, your green herbs. And these herbs of the field also include the various herbs that even in the world today are so, prom so promoted, the various different herbs that are looked at as, as medicinal. Aloe vera, golden seal, peppermint, and all the various different herbs that are, are, are being being promoted in various books all over the newsstands today talking about cures and natural healing and even there's some uh, some of these books called, called Bible cures but it's funny that some of these books called Bible cures all the various different things they're talking about aren't connected with Bible truth don't really talk about uh, you know I saw one book that said Bible cures I said hmm what's this look through it I don't think I saw Jesus' name anywhere in there I looked and looked and looked I didn't see anything about the gospel. I didn't see anything about the cross. I didn't see anything about the saving power of God. I saw that there was a way that you could eat. And, but brothers and sisters, we must combine these things together. When Jesus gave in Genesis 1.29 the perfect diet, where did the perfect diet or where was man's blessing of continued life found? It was found at the tree. In Acts 10, the Bible says in Acts 10 and verse 38 that when Jesus was crucified, he was hung upon a tree. Because that tree in Genesis 1.29, or the trees, were symbolically representing the plan of salvation. And that man always would have to, if sin came in the world, man would have to go and daily partake of the fruit of Calvary. And by eating of that tree daily, they would have life in them. Jesus says, unless you eat and drink of me, you have no life in me. Jesus says in John 10 and verse 10, that I have come that you may have life and have it more Abundant. So when we look at the diet principles and the health principles and the natural healing principles of the word of God, the gospel of health are constantly drawing our mind back to a loving savior, a loving creator. It's drawing our minds back to the cross and thinking about the fact that Jesus died, that we may have spiritual life. And he's given us also his word and the principles of his word that we may know how to obey the principles of God. The principles of God's word that by following these principles in connection with faith in him, we may have that life and life more abundantly. He may reveal unto us the abundance of peace and truth, and we may receive the healing and cure we stand in need of. Can I share a text with you before we go to our second sheet? Look at the book of Exodus. Look at this promise here. Exodus 15. 
We're going to our second sheet because we want to just look at some of these biblical principles before we go to our practical sheet. But in Exodus 15, notice what it says here. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26. Notice what the God of heaven, even Jesus, said to the ancient Jews. In the time of Moses, Jesus gave a wonderful promise showing that if you truly have faith in him and are going to follow him, he will heal, strengthen, and redeem you. But when he shows this truth, he says that the way he'll do it is through you obeying the principles he's given for even health. Look what it says in Exodus 15. Exodus 15, beginning with verse 26. Say amen when you have that. Amen. Second book of your Bible, the 15th chapter and verse 26. It says, and God said, if thou wilt diligently, are we there? If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give air to what? His commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these, what? Diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that... Do you see what it said? God predicated his giving of healing, not just upon his love, because he loves us. The Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We know God loves us. We know the Father loves us because he sent his son to die for us. We know that. But God said his love even has a purpose in your natural physical life. He says right here that I want you to understand that I want to give you healing. The Egyptians did not receive my blessing and healing. Why? Because I have given commandments, statutes, and principles that if they are followed will bring health. And if they're followed, they will bring life. And these diseases that came upon the Egyptians were a result of not following this revealed will. So follow my will. Trust in me. Follow these principles. And the same thing you saw when you were in Egypt that fell upon the Egyptians, I will not allow them to come upon you or I had the power to remove them if it's my will. Because, you know, sometimes God wants us to be challenged. Do you know that? You ever read the book of Job? Was it God's will for him to be challenged? But you know that when you serve God, that you will be healed? Guaranteed. They say, are you sure? God heals in three ways. If you believe in God, you're going to be healed. God heals in how many ways? Three. three ways. And if you truly believe in God and you're serving the Lord, you will be healed. But do you know those three ways? The three ways God heals are, number one, he heals miraculously. He heals how? Miraculously. What does miraculous mean? God can, with a word, heal. Can he? It's all through the scriptures. He can, with a word, he can heal. The Bible says in Psalm 104, he sent his word and healed them, right? But God also heals through a process of obedience. We saw it just right here. God says commandments and statutes. God also, when he healed the man that had that clay, we're going to read that in our second sheet here. That man that had the clay upon his eyes, he could have said, you know what? Let the eyes be open. He put clay. Then he told him to go and walk down to this pool. Then told him to wash in the pool, and the Bible said the man came back seeing. He didn't even see there. He came back to thank God, and in faith as he came back, he received his healing. It's a process, right? It's a process. God says in the book of 1 Corinthians, he says, whether you eat or drink, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. For whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Even in our eating, we are glorifying God through the process of just eating our daily food. We may be glorifying God and going in the process of maintaining or recovering health to glorify God. So number one, yes, miraculously God can heal. But that's his will to do how he wants to do it. Number two, through a process. Amen? Amen. And number three, in the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 says, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, just like 1 Thessalonians said, in a moment, in a, almost an indivisible second, this mortal is going to put on immortality. And this corruptible, that means subject to death and decay, shall put on incorruption. Is that healing? You can't get any better healing than that. Immortality? So, brothers and sisters, if you believe in Jesus, even if you die today, will you be healed? Yes. Yes. But God may give you 15 years of Hezekiah. And in that time, he may, through a process, restore your health. Restore you like with wings of eagles. Or he might, in a moment, heal you. But let me look at Exodus 15. I want to make a point about these three methods. I want to make a point. In Exodus 15, it says, verse 26, this again. 
Verse 26, and God said, if thou wilt diligently hearken, that means listen to obey, the voice of the Lord thy God, that means the word of God, because the word of God is in the, the, the voice of God is the word of God. And will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healed thee. Think about this. If God healed you miraculously, in an instant, that miraculous healing may call you to have great faith and gratitude toward God. Amen? You might be gra grateful. Wouldn't you be grateful? Amen. But how many scriptures did you look at? How many passages and books did you read through to see what God's will is to make sure that your life is in harmony with that and to examine yourself like Elijah did and examine yourself like Hezekiah did and, and cry to the Lord to make sure that you're doing all that he's asked you to do that you might be ordering your steps in your word. You see the difference? One is a blessing and there's no, there's no diminishing God's blessing. However, when you are studying and reading and examining your walk against the word of God, you're being educated in the principles of God. The person that reads and keeps and is studying these commandments, that he may know them, this education is strengthening him in a Christian walk. If you are miraculously healed because you have not done that study or that prayer or that reading into God's word, you might go right back to the thing that caused you the original problem. Can you see it? You might go right back to it. And, you are, and the Bible says, of course, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth and not to him is sin. You might be ignorant of it, but does God want us to be ignorant? And at the time of this ignorant, God winked at it. But now he calls all men to do what? Amen. Repent. And we repent based upon light. The path of the justice is a shining light. which shines more and more into the perfect day. God wants to give us light, then we walk in it. Don't you agree with that? That's Bible truth. So God wants us to have a more excellent way of being healed. Even though he may heal miraculously, God desires greater that you would study his word because by studying the word, you're putting that life in you. You're being brought to the cross. You're being convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And you're getting the greater of healing because I would rather die sick in Jesus than live a healthy life and go to hell. Got quiet inside it, Elder McCain. Got quiet inside it. Some people just want to be healthy. I would rather, brothers and sisters, die sick in Jesus than have a healthy body and use it for the devil. There's no benefit, brothers and sisters. What is it, what is it profit a man, the Bible says, to gain this whole world, whether it be in our bodies or in wealth, and do what? Lose a soul. So even when you look at the way that I am presenting and going to be presenting these messages to you, I can go through a whole litany of testimonies of things I've done and people I've worked with and so on. But brothers and sisters, what does it profit you to learn all these practical things I can show you and, and give you great insights? But then, because you don't believe in Jesus, you don't trust in him, you're not familiar with his word, you don't see the beauty of his harmony and his truth, then you lose, with all that knowledge, your soul. There must be a drawing to Christ. It must be a gospel of health, not just a, t a class on health. It must be a drawing to the Savior, an understanding of his principles and ways. In Exodus 15, 26, we see that God desired to reveal truth to us, reveal his commandments, that we may keep them. And these health principles, as well as these principles of truth, are bringing us into a relationship with him. Amen. Amen. Now, we don't want to take too long on part two, because we want to get to this practical part and close. We want to keep it too long, and then you don't come back tomorrow night. I'm not going to keep you too long. On your second sheet, part two, we want to look at just two texts. Two texts. The first text we already looked at in our first sheet, Jeremiah 33, 6. We looked at that promise, and we're still thanking God for that beautiful promise. But I want to look at number two. Number two, 2 Kings 5, 10 and 11. It says, Elisha taught faith in what? Are you there? Your second sheet. Biblical principles or practical principles of gospel healing, part two. Are we there? Elijah taught faith in what? Repetitive. Am I, am I the only one here tonight? Okay. At least you're here. Praise God for you. Elijah taught faith in repetitive baths for healing. Notice I said faith in repetitive baths. Not just repetitive baths, but what? Faith in. Because God's word said to do it. God's word said to do it. Look what it says in 2 Kings. Faith in. Now, you may go and return to 2 Kings to what's called a spa. You ever heard of a spa nowadays? And they say, you go to a spa and you, you spend $100 for them to give you a bath. Can you imagine that? I'll give you a bath for, for nothing. 
hundred dollars to get a bath. And the same type of repetitive bath or bathing that Elijah told the king to do is the same type of thing they do at these spas. Why? Because they work. But we need to have faith in God's word to do that because there's a lot of things that people say to do for healing, but where is it found here? I'd rather do what God's word says and be following God's word and do what the devil may say to do because the devil has principles of healing too. Now, you didn't get that, but you get it after we finish these sessions here. In 2 Kings 5, it says this. 2 Kings 5, 2 Kings 5, beginning with verse 10. Say amen when you have that. 2 Kings 5, 10 says this. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan. How many times? Seven times. Seven One time? Seven. Seven times. And thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth, he was angry, and went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leprosy. See, Naaman was a leper. And when you look at what he was thinking, he said, You know what? He told me to go and do some bathing in the Jordan seven times. I thought he would come out to me and stand right here and call upon the name of his God, and that word strike in the Hebrew means to shake back and forth. To shake my hand, his hand back and forth and make the leprosy go away. What kind of healing do you want? Miraculous healing. I thought he would give me some kind of magic. I thought he'd come and stand and call upon God and move his hand back and forth and make it go away. In other words, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to believe. I just have to stand there and he just moves his hand and he does it. So I have faith in him. But he told him in the name of the Lord, go to Jordan where God's done all his miracles. Go down to Jordan where the name of the Lord is. Go down to Jordan where the people of God cross over. Go down. See, the, the ancient uh, pagans, they knew what Jordan represented. They knew that on the other side of Jordan was God's land and that God had promised and made promises through Jordan. God had opened the Jordan. God had done miracles in the Jordan. God had even baptized his people in the Jordan and it had a special significance. Go to Jordan. Go to where God's name is and I want you to dip down inside there seven times. I want you know, to come and, and no, I don't want to give you miraculous healing or you to trust in me. Go to where God's word says, and I want you to bathe seven times. I want you to go in the water and come out of the water. Go in the water, come out of the water. You ever go down to the beach? Anyone been to the beach? Yes. You go inside that water and it's nice and warm, right? And when you come out, it feels kind of cold. And you go back in, it's nice and, so maybe, maybe he was doing hot and cold treatments. <laughs> Repetitive bathing. And you know, and when you go down in that water, the, water the, the Jordan was muddy. Had a lot of clay inside there, a lot of mineral salt inside there. And by faith in the Jordan, faith in, faith in the Word, he did this which was... Have you ever heard of a leper going and taking a bath and being healed? But faith in God, brother, I want to submit to you that this was faith in God's word that healed them. But even the act itself has been proven by science to have recuperative, therapeutic and healing properties. It's called hydrotherapy. You ever heard of football? These guys are getting million dollars, tens of million dollars to play football. And they hurt their knees and they hurt their backs. And guess what they do? They, not, not they give them medicines and so on, but guess what they do to recu recu recuperate them and re rehabilitate them? Guess what they do? Hydrotherapy. They put them in baths, whirlpool baths, sits bath, all these type of baths. They put, they put uh, Epsom salts inside there. They put various different things inside there to, to draw out inflammation. They put ice, which is water, on there. They put heating pads on there. They do various things, which is just... Hydrotherapy. Elijah taught faith in repetitive bathing brings healing. What do you believe? Do you have faith in that? Do you think if you understood how to use these things, it could cause you to have better health or to start revealing to you or showing you principles by which God heals? See, the world is doing these things without the Bible, and we with the Bible are what? Not doing it. The world without the Bible is doing these things, and we with the Bible are not doing them. Isn't that sad? But we hasten. We hasten. Let's go on. Now, number four. We don't need to go to number four, do we? Because we all know that one of the main ways that God heals is to call the elders and pray and do what? Anoint the sick. Pray and anoint the sick. But guess what? Guess what? We're going to number five. 
Number five, because we need to understand that sometimes when we're afflicted, it's not only a physical issue, it's also what? Spiritual. Nine tenths of disease are found in the mind. And even the enemy of our soul desires to afflict the mind, to bring temptation. And, bring, and look what it says in the book of Matthew 17. We're in the New Testament. The teachings of Jesus. Matthew 17. As we turn to Matthew 17, we're getting ready to go into some practical things as we close. Matthew 17 says this. Look what Jesus says. Matthew 17. Remember those disciples? Always fighting amongst each other. Who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? Because they always were contending and fighting amongst each other and always wanted to be the greatest, always the one to lead out, always wanted to preach because they had all the desires of trying to be the greatest and, and lead out and, and be the one close to Jesus. They never had any power. Never had any power. And sometimes they would have great success and say, all oh, these demons are subject to us and they're listening to us in the name of Jesus. But look what it says here. They were fighting amongst each other and they thought that they could still fight and, and, and talk about each other and had all these ill feelings and still had success in ministry. It couldn't happen. And nor could an individual who needed healing receive it unless something was taking place. Look what it says in Matthew 17 and verse 21. Brothers and sisters, God is trying to show us problems in our lives, in my life, that I need the victory over tonight. Matthew 17 and verse 21 says this. Jesus said to them, how be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Amen. They knew the word. They would come out of him in Jesus' name. Get out, you, dead, you, you foul spirit. Putting hands on, laying on. They were doing everything but had no power. Why did Jesus say? He said, this kind goeth not out except by prayer and fasting. Seeking the Lord in sincerity and denying yourself, pushing the plate back. And brothers and sisters, you know, sometimes when we look at the idea of pushing the plate back and seeking the Lord in prayer, in humility, sometimes God not only wants to push the plate back for a season, he wants to put, push some things off the plate completely. Am I, am I meddling now? Sometimes God wants to put some things off the plate completely for the glory of God. Because you know what fasting is? Fasting is going without food. Isn't that the de definition of fasting? Look it up on the on dictionary. It's, it's, it's the going without food for a reason, right? Now, going without food can mean going without any food. Amen? Amen. And going without food can mean going out without some food. Because I've been fasting for about 30 years now. You say you look like it, right? <laughs> I've been fasting for 30 years. It's not that I've been going without any food, but there's certain foods I have fasted from for 30 years. And I can testify before God and the, and the assembled angels, I've experienced better health, I've experienced a closer walk with God, and a great abiding peace in faith in God's word because of it. I have no desire to go back. No desire. I have been fasting from some things that I found that the word of God showed were harmful and that I could have even a greater spiritual power without. So for the glory of God, for the, the, the ability of me to have the blessing, the breakthrough that I needed, and to help others have breakthroughs like the disciples wanted, something's going to go out by what? Prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. So if we want to have the, the, the victory, the healing, the power that God desires to have, we need to put some of these principles in, in effect that God may do for us that what he desires to do. How many want God to do for them what he desires to do for us? Amen. Do you want God's will to be seen in your life? I do. Amen. So let's talk about our last sheet as we come to a close. Our last sheet. Our last sheet is our friend Hastings here. Our last sheet is called Gospels or the God's Blueprint for Health. God's Blueprint for Health. On this sheet, as we summarize and come to a close now, I want to share with you seven principles of Bible healing, some of the things we've seen even on our handout right tonight. Seven things you can start right now. I don't care where you are. You might be overweight. You might be underweight. You may be sick. You may desire to <clears throat> deal with some type of, of uh, problem you're having with your digestive system. There's various different things you might be experiencing right now. And wherever you are, say you maybe you're, you're out of shape and you want to get back in shape. And you might be, sometimes, and I'm not trying to be funny now, but sometimes you have individuals that have not exercised for so long that you don't want to just jump up and start trying to, to run a marathon the first day. Does that make sense? 
Doesn't make sense. Th there are eight principles of health that we're going to look at in our future talks, and one of them is exercise. But we have to understand that there's a way to seem as right to a man, but the end there are the ways of death. Don't get up there and try and think you're going to try and run a marathon the first day. Try now to start implementing some of these simple principles and start moving in a direction where God can deal with the body internally and externally and prepare you for what you need to do. Some things go only by what? Fasting and prayer. Look what it says on your sheet. God's plan. Everyone have one? God's blueprint for health. And anyone needs one of these later on, you can get it from the website. It says God's blueprint for health. It says, is your immune system ready for what? Swine flu. What, what, what season are we going into right now? Flu season. It's coming up now because this weather's about to change here pretty soon. And then in a very short period of time, that, that cold snap's going to come through. And then as soon as that cold snap comes through, what do we have? We have Thanksgiving, right? Christmas, New Year's. And we have some good eating around there, right? Good. We have some good eating around there, right? Pies and cakes and so on. October 31st, we have Halloween, all that candy people are going to eat. Cold and flu season is coming in. Not just because of the weather, because how people are going to eat. And swine's flu and all the different types of flus that are going around now, have they gone away? No. They're waiting for you. They're waiting for you, brothers and sisters. But we want to strengthen our immune system, strengthen our, our body's ability to fight off disease through God's principles. Look what it says. Number seven. We're going to go seven all the way to number one, quickly. Seven. Eating a large fresh salad before you cook foods. Eating what? A large fresh salad before your cook food. Now you can read all this when you get home. I'm going to summarize it. You can read it when you get home. I, I've given you it in written form so you can study when you get home by yourself. You've got to do some homework, right? What do I mean by that? When you eat your cooked foods, whether it be your rice or whatever you're eating, your body is going to have a better ability to digest if you have some fresh produce before that. Whether you eat a fresh fruit salad, some kind of a fruit salad or something like that, that, that combines nicely, digests nicely with your cooked meal. Or if you use vegetables, a nice salad that goes well. Eating these things when? First, tends to help with digestion. When you get those fresh enzymes, those raw enzymes, you know what enzymes are? Enzymes are chemical catalysts found in food that help digest, help break down digest. They actually provide a strengthening effect of the body, an antioxidant effect of the body, a, a, a healing effect of the body, but also they help with digestion. And when you eat those things first, they also keep you from eating too much of the cooked food, and they give you the, like, the nutrients and the digestive power to really help digest the cooked food. Because sometimes when you have the cooked foods, because of the cooking process, they lack certain enzymes and so on, and they might not be as easy to digest. So eating the fresh fruit or vegetable first helps with digestion. And when you digest well, you don't have indigestion. Make sense? How many commercials for Rolaids and Tums and antacids do you see on, on commercials nowadays? Hundreds of them. Why? Because people have digestive problems. Why? Because as you get older, when you get to be around 30, 35, the digestive juices in your stomach, the hydrochloric acid in your, di in your stomach starts to weaken, starts to get less. So if you eat these high protein foods thinking that you're 17 when you're 71, you're going to have some trouble, brothers and sisters. And that's why, beyond the fact that too much protein is not good for you, that's why so many people have digestive problems of taking Tums and Rolaids and Pepto-Bismol and all these various different things, trying to deal with something that could be even just started in a small way by having a nice salad first or a fruit cup, a nice fruit cup first, before you eat your cooked food. Suggestion. You can read it when you get home. Number six, water drinking. How many drink water? Do you know how much water you should drink? Now, when people talk about drinking water, there's various rules of thumb. Somebody said, drink as much as you could see between two fingers. Yeah, there's so many old wives. Drink as much as you can see between two fingers. That's, if, if your fingers can go like that, that's how much you need. Or, or, or drink six glasses, people say. But brothers and sisters, you know, when you look at six glasses, how much water you need is based upon how much body mass you have. Six glasses of water is generally the type of water that someone about my body size needs. Maybe a little bit, maybe 10 to 15 pounds more than me, but around that weight is six glasses. Generally, you need more than six average glasses of water. What water you need is generally, you take your weight, say for instance you weigh 200 pounds. You take that number, you cut it in half. 200, whatever your weight is, cut it in half. 
When you cut in half, that's the number of ounces you need a day to deal with your basic body processes and promote health. So you need 100 ounces. Now that's seven bottles or whatever it may be. You need to try and factor that in throughout your day. When you get up in the morning and drink some, have some in the afternoon, have some in the evening before you go to bed, you don't have any troubles. You want to try and get that in because if you try drinking that, what you're going to find is, as you start drinking this amount of water, if you need to lose weight by drinking the amount you need for your body mass, you're going to start to lose weight. Your body's recuperative power is not going to kick in because all the healing properties of the body, all the healing agencies of the body, all the body's restorative and even cell multiplying factors in the body are based upon water. And they are activated by hydration. So if you're chronically dehydrated, your body can't work and restore as it should. You're going to find that people that drink enough water and even eat enough fruits and vegetables, they tend to look much younger than they actually are. And they into their later years continue to look younger because their digestion is better, they're getting fresh enzymes and antioxidants in their food, and they're completely and continually hydrating themselves because one of the greatest way to have more wrinkles in the body and the skin to sag is not to have enough water in the cells. And then the, the skin starts to sag, the skin starts to become sallow, et cetera, et cetera. You need to drink water. You need to drink what? Water. Number five. Point number five. A morning drink. It's going to help you with drinking your water. And also going to help you, again, with your digestion and the, the, the cleansing, recuperative power of the body. You ever heard of an organ in your body called the liver? You ever heard of the liver? You ever heard of liver spots? Where do liver spots come from? When the liver starts going bad, you start getting skin problems, right? And you, when your liver goes really bad, you start to get jaundice and all the various things. It's really, really bad. The liver is one of the largest organs in the body. It's a great detoxifying organ. It cleanses the body. It takes poisons and cleanses or even converts them into things that the body can use. And also, Practically all your brain chemicals, the great majority of your brain chemicals that are dealing with thinking and concentration and all these things are created in the liver. It's very essential. But many times because of poor diet, eating the wrong foods, eating late at night, eating things that are, are not best for you, having indigestion continually and over and over, those things generally are a tax upon the liver. High protein foods all over and over, it taxes the liver. And the liver becomes sluggish. And on your way to start restoring the body and following these principles, what I call a morning drink is usually very therapeutic and good. And it is basically this. It says taking 10 ounces of water and the juice of one half or a whole lemon squeeze into it. What was that? 10 ounces of water and half a lemon or a whole lemon. I'll start with a half first. Now, I'll, my, I'll, I'll tell you something that I've known uh, women that have uh, morning sickness. You ever heard of morning sickness? Some people, the men said yes, the women said nothing. Okay, we'll, we'll wonder why that, why that was. Morning sickness. And they feel that, that nausea. And taking a little bit of lemon, even in a ward like this, quickly deals with morning sickness. Because a lot of times, a lot of times, morning sickness is because as a woman starts to get further and further along with her pregnancy, and the organs start to become displaced, <clears throat> the liver starts to become sluggish. And morning sickness is a result of that, especially happens in the morning. And a little bit of lemon generally allays nausea, generally, especially when it deals with the liver. But this drink helps stimulate the liver. It helps cleanse the blood. By drinking 10 ounces, especially if you warm that water, make it like a tea, and squeeze the lemon inside there, it helps facilitate you having proper bowel management. In other words, sometimes people are constipated and have problems by taking this 10 ounces of water, especially if it's warm in the morning, with that lemon inside, it stimulates the liver, it stimulates the bowel, it cleanses the blood, it starts the mind, because this liver is starting to function correctly, then the mind starts to become clear. And if you do this before you start studying your Bible, guess what? You're going to start seeing more things, retaining more things. Ever, ever go and start reading your Bible in the morning, and next thing you, you wake up, and it's time to go to... Is that just me? <laughs> you wake up. What happened? You fell asleep. But maybe if you got a good waking up, a good glass of some water, and you drank that, and it starts to rejuvenate you and get you going and got your mind going right, then maybe you could really go into the Word and really get a benefit from that. 
That morning drink gives you 10 ounces of the water you need to drink, and it starts to stimulate the body to start going on a path of restoration. You can't just jump into, these are some simple things you could do to start today to start moving in the principle of health. We're coming back tomorrow, aren't we? Tomorrow we have a session, and then Wednesday, and as we go day by day, we're gonna see that practically we can start somewhere and move toward understanding and embracing the principle of health. We're closing. Number four, showers. Now, I'm not trying to insult you and say you don't take showers. On this heading of showers, just showing you that the showers you have in your home can be used therapeutically. Therapeutically. It's something called a hot and cold shower. And for you ladies, don't worry about it. Just put a shower cap on. Your hair is going to be fine. I'm telling you, don't, don't. Women see that shower thing, they say, oh, no. Showers are therapy. Get a shower cap. All you do is do three minutes hot, 30 seconds cold. Some people say, oh, cold water? Well, do three minutes warm, 30 seconds cool. And start out there. Don't get, get, get caught up on the cold part. It's called a contrast shower. What's more important at the beginning stage is the contrast rather than being scalding hot or freezing cold. The contrast. When you have this kind of contrast, a three minute to 30 second ratio, physiologically what it does to your body is it causes the, exp the contraction and expansion of the, of the muscle tissues, the blood vessels, it causes circulation to increase, and also it's been physiologically proven, scientifically proven, that what it does is it, it, it builds the immune system. It causes your thymus to release white blood cells. It causes, even out of the bone marrow, white blood cells to come out. And what do white blood cells do? They fight bacteria, they fight viruses, they are, they're strengthening the immune system to do a work. So that if you're fighting, I've known people that have started to feel that pain in their back, that scratchiness, that means that a flu is coming on. You know what that, that feeling is? That little, you don't know what that feeling is? Yeah. That, that little headache, that's, it's a slight headache, but it's not really there yet, and you feel that, that scratching, like, uh-oh, what's, 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 it, it's not really there yet, that little maybe pain in the back. And, and what do people say? Oh, I'm tired, let's go to bed. If you go to bed, by the time you wake in the morning, it is over. What you need to do is as soon as you can get home, do a hot... Can anyone testify to these things working? Anyone testify? Oh, look at those hands, look at those hands. Amen. You go and you do the hot and cold shower, and that hot and cold shower will get your circulation going. And that circulation going very good, it helps to flush that virus out as the white blood cells come out of the thymus and the bone marrow to fight and push it out. When you go to bed, you wake up, and generally, if you call it in time, most times you will, the virus will be kicked out and you will be fine because the showers are a repetitive bathing type of scenario just like Elisha had. Hot and cold, the contrast. Start out with warm and cool and you can basically build yourself up till you actually can go to hot and cold. But three minutes hot, 30 seconds cold. Now you say, well, I can't remember that. It's written right here for you. Written right here for you. Turn your page over as we close. Turn your page over. Number three, fast and pray. Fast and pray. Where, where, where can everyone start? Fasting and prayer. You say, well, I'm a diabetic. You still can fast and pray. Take certain things out of your diet for a season. If anyone's a diabetic, you say, I can't eat. I have to eat something. Well, <clears throat> this is how you're going to fast. Fast off of all white rice, all white bread, all refined white products, and use brown rice. Use whole grain bread and whole grain, like oats and stuff like that, rather than, than cream of wheat, use oatmeal, whole oatmeal. Fast from those things and use these things. I will guarantee if you do that, your blood sugar will be totally different. As a matter of fact, if you do something like that, you need to actually make sure that you're getting the right amount of insulin because once you do that, your insulin is going to be totally different because you don't need as much insulin if you're eating whole grains. If you're eating refined grains, those refined grains that have been released and removed from fiber, let's, let's make a, a, a quick illustration. You see my fingers coming together like this, interlocking together? That's what fiber is. And in between these fingers is where your sugars are, glucose and amylase and all these things are in between my fingers. The fiber locks in together and holds the fruit or vegetable or whatever it is together. And in those, that network is your sugars. To get to the sugar, you have to do what? You have to chew, and chew, and chew, and break down that fiber network, and break down that fiber network so the 
sugars can be released, the carbohydrates, the, the proteins can be released. The fiber is like a buffer to slow down the releasing of sugars into your system. Amen? It, 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 it slows it down. But if you do not have fiber in your food, if you're eating white bread and white rice and all these various different things, these things don't have any fiber. So the sugar goes right into the system. It's like an injection. It goes in so quickly, the body's ability, the pancreas' ability to release insulin to deal with it is not as powerful as that. And many times you have what's called um, um, insulin, mm, non-responsive insulin activity in your body where the, the pancreas is not, it gets to the point where the pancreas says, I just give up. I just give up. I, you know, I'm trying to, to keep up with all this, but I can't do it. And the pancreas starts to slow down and maybe even starts working until you start changing your diet. I've seen people on all types of levels of insulin fast, if you will, or put aside some of these refined, probably all these refined sugars and so on, and go on whole grains, go on a simple diet, just like we talked about today, and start drinking water, and doing these simple things, and slowly as learn more and more about diet and continue to do it over a period of time, they actually got off the insulin, doctor took them off the insulin, and they have not had a, an injection in years. You say, are you sure? But, do, do you know that I've seen people that were about to go on insulin, on injections, come to meetings like this, and start doing these simple principles from the Word of God, and when they went back to their doctor, I've seen hundreds of people that have gone back to their doctor, the doctor said, well, I know what the test did say, but now it says, that person says, yeah, we prayed, but as we prayed, we also showed them the revealing of God's truth. And they followed that truth to the saving of their health. It's God's principles of health. God's way works. And Brother says, I believe if you use it, God's going to work for you as well. It says here, fast and pray. It talks about praying and taking time to seek God. If we want to have true healing, we have to seek God. We have to seek the creator of all things to heal us. It says, even if you go, and number two, to do this work of seeking God, you may say, I'm not sure what I should pray. Oh, how I should pray? We have some books that we can share with you. Maybe tomorrow and then after you want some books like the book Christ Object Lessons, Steps of Christ. These are wonderful devotional books that in the morning or when you're having a season of prayer are perfect books to help you see the steps in Christian living and even prayer that you might be blessed. Some people say, I don't know what to pray. There's various scripture helps that can help you start moving in a spiritual and a physical way to hell. Our last one, number one. Number one, what, what does it say? Devotion or Bible study, worship and reading. Brothers and sisters, do you know if you want to have life in you and health, it's found in the Word? Because we, we've talked about foods and herbs and leaves and <clears throat> Poultice and so on and so forth, and various things, even you eat, and even eating better, which we're going to expand upon tomorrow and the day after. But, brothers and sisters, Jesus says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word. Every word. So, how could I even look at all these various things that are so good and that God created to heal and help you, and not even end, even at this time, dealing with the fact that we must read and study and eat the Word? The Word of God. Study. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Jesus says, the letter killeth, but the spirit maketh alive. So we need to have the spirit and the word. When we talk about praying and seeking God, we must pray for the Holy Spirit. We must ask God to give us an understanding mind and, a, and an obedient heart. And we must go into God's word and find those scripture promises, those teachings, those principles that are showing us how we may find the way of life. There's a way of life inside it. There's teaching that promote life, but there's a way of life. It's found through Calvary. It's found through Jesus Christ. And the principles that we study tonight are just a part of His great plan along with conversion and regeneration and the new life in Christ that gives the Christian the ability to witness in these last days. What do I mean by that? As we close, there's a text in the book of Matthew 24 and verse 14. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, how? For a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. There is a witness we must have. There is a way that we must be living and acting and presenting ourselves in all sincerity and humility and truth before the people of God, and even before the world, that as the Bible says, the men may see our good works 
and glorify our Father in heaven. We have to be living as a living testimony of what God can do. How did Jesus give testimony of Him being the Son of God and that He had power to heal disease, I'm sorry, heal sin or to forgive sin? He healed the sick. The greatest thing we see in the New Testament that testified to Jesus' divine mission and His character, who He was, was the healing of the sick. This was a witness to the world and the church that the Messiah had come and that they were to get their house order and obey, receive, and follow the gospel. Brothers and sisters, in this last time of earth's history, these last days, the same thing Jesus did then, He desires to do now. The greatest witness to break down prejudice and to get the attention of the world is for the people of this church to start throwing away the things that they used to love. To start standing in a greater amount of health. Even you can testify, hey, you know what? I struggled with this for you, but now in the Word of God I see a clear way and I'm walking in it and look at my, I've improved my health. I've gotten off this medicine, that medicine. I feel better. I've lost weight. I walk now. I, I, I'm feeling better than I felt in 10 years. The headaches I had, they're gone. What a testimony. If Jesus had, te had those men testify all those years ago to his saving power and it caused all of Galilee to come, what would happen to this area if people found out that there was a healing power in the Word of God, in this church, as witnessed by its members. Do you know what would happen? We have to break these walls out and expand them out. We have to break the back on them, span it out. People be running and coming and saying, hey, I, because there are, very, there are thousands and millions of people that don't want Jesus. But guess what they want? They want their help back. And Jesus many times found people and he let, let, brought them to exercise faith in him through his healing power. Through his healing power. Brothers and sisters, how about you tonight? Can you believe on Jesus tonight? Can you believe that Jesus died that you might have not just spiritual life, but even physical life? He said, I wish above all things that I would prosper and be in health, even as your soul that I died upon the cross for. Even as that, I want you to have health. But what do you say? You break the tie. What do you say? Do you desire it? Do you desire to even come back tomorrow night as we really delve deeply into these principles and go into further handouts and studies and look at this thing even deeper? Pray with me, if you will. Just bow your heads and just pray. Father, we pray for the Holy Spirit to give us a greater understanding of the principles of the word that we studied tonight. A greater understanding of the truth of your love for us. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Lord, we believe that by this gift in Jesus Christ and the words that he has given us in counsel, in statutes, in teachings, that we may have this life and life more abundant. We may have this great entrance into the kingdom of God beginning here upon earth. Help us to order our steps in your word, dear God. Help us even to take the advantage of these studies, these classes that have started tonight. Take these handouts home and look at these scriptures again. Look at these handouts. Study and pray over them. And ask God, what would thou have me to do? As I look at these scriptures, what would thou have me to do? Show me thy way in the scriptures. You've promised us in Jeremiah 33, 6, you said to us, behold, I will bring it. And we're holding you to it, dear Lord. You said, behold, I will bring it, health and cure, and I will, I will cure them, and I will reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. And Lord, you reveal an abundance of peace and truth tonight. And Lord, we desire and we have faith that you will bring the healing and cure as you desire it as well. For we trust, we're trusting in you. We're looking for you to do this for us. In Jesus' name.